The song we just sung always amazes me as I've sung it all my life. For I will spend eternity. That shows you how difficult, if not impossible, it is for our limited, finite minds to grasp the unending day that is eternity. You don't spend it. No way to spend it. It's just simply there and you're part of it in that place that's not governed by time. We were beginning to study and just didn't finish it this morning, the question of is the doctrine of a burning hell where the wicked are tormented eternally after death a true doctrine? And we entered into that study by looking at what Jehovah's Witnesses had said and Let God Be True, page 99, published by the Watchtower Society in their second edition. And they claimed it was not true because of four reasons. First one, we've already dealt with, where they said it is wholly unscriptural, and we simply asked the question, is hell scriptural? And we gave you exactly what the Bible had to say about it. The second one is, is it unreasonable? And we were in the process of looking at that. And I want you to notice that one thing that was done in the preaching of the gospel, and any time you see this, you know it wasn't done just one time, and that was the end of it. But it's what you have with Paul's sermon when he is preaching to Felix. And verse 25 of Acts chapter 24 reads, this is Paul of Paul, it is said, and he reasoned. He reasoned of righteousness, temperance with his self-control, and judgment to come. Now, Felix was typical of those people at that day and time that we spent some time on this morning trying to get the understanding somewhat of the culture and the people in it in the Roman world. But the impact of Paul's preaching the gospel, and you can't do it without reasoning. It's a reasonable thing. You appeal to man's reason. As he reasoned to Felix of righteousness, and all of God's commandments of righteousness, Psalms 119, verse 172, and the righteousness of which he spake had to be the gospel because that was the power of God to save, Romans 116. And the self-control business, which wasn't known among the Gentiles, they simply went after whatever their lust guided them to fulfill. And then judgment to come. I said this morning that was a new thing to people then. It was, it was something they could not grasp. It wasn't in their background. It was involved in their religion of a judgment like is pictured in the Bible. But there was no use for Felix to tremble if he wasn't realized he was going to be on the wrong side of that statement or the exercise of God's justice at the end of time. If you're a faithful Christian, you heard those words and you didn't fear them. They motivated you more to stay closer to God and study in obedience to His Word, but you don't fear them like a person outside of Christ, still in their sins, or a person who's in Christ, but is not living like they know they ought to live and are not even trying. Then a person ought to tremble. Not just their body trembling, but their soul trembling. For as we read from the Hebrews epistle in verse 27 of chapter 10, for those who do not abide by the truth of the gospel, there's only a certain fearful looking for a judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. All of the various judgments that you see delivered against the world in the flood, against Sodom and Gomorrah, against the Canaanites by the Israelites, and such things, all of those are simply heralding the fact that someday God will have a complete and final judgment of all men at the end of all material and physical things. 
you have reasoning done by Peter and by Jude that reaches back to such accounts and is written for the good of the people like us who are Christians in the church to keep us faithful. And when you begin to read in these passages, you'll see, and I happen to be looking at Jude here, that when God said He would destroy the wicked, did He? He kept His promise, didn't He? When He said He would deliver the righteous, did He? When He kept His promise. Well, I have no reason to believe that he'll not keep the same promises. To the faithful, he will deliver them. He delivered just Lot, didn't he? A righteous man who was vexed with the filthy conduct of those people in those terrible cities. He said he would, and he kept his promise. Well, he's telling us by that and throughout the New Testament that he's going to keep his promise concerning his justice. And those who are justified in Christ by their faithful compliance with his will, he'll keep his promise to them to save them eternally in heaven. Well, the same God, a God of justice at the judgment, is going to condemn those who are outside of Christ, or they die unfaithful. But these uh, people said that eternal hellfire punishment is unreasonable also. Well, is hell unreasonable? I think I read this uh, to you. Imperfect man does not torture even a mad dog, they said, but kills it. And yet the clergyman attribute to God, who is his love, the wicked crime of torturing human creatures merely because they had the misfortune to be born sinners. Watch to our society, let God be true, page 98. <clears throat> God is not torturing these people. He's punishing these people. Used to, when you studied sociology in that field called criminology, you would have classes and books written on crime and punishment. There was actual belief that people ought to be punished as a consequence for them breaking the law. But over the years, there's been a change. You don't hear that terminology anymore, as in a lot of cases, you don't hear terminology that's proper. People are not cause to think much about when you do wrong you ought to be punished now you may hear crime and rehabilitation well I'm all for somebody being rehabilitated but uh, that doesn't rule out being punished for the crime you did never has it never will when you're rearing up a child in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, that child, as we all did and our children have, has done wrong. Well, they need to understand there are consequences to do, doing wrong. doesn't mean you can't demonstrate forgiveness and that you're not casting the child off. But people need to know, as we studied in another sermon, how that when you do wrong, that there is absolute objective wrong. And the wrong comes because you violated the absolute objective truth. Then they suffer for it. One of the things is so bad nowadays is that people do wrong and they think they shouldn't have to suffer for it. But the Bible doesn't teach anything like that. And I've already referred us to Hebrews 10, 26 through 31, where Paul's talking to Christians who already obeyed the gospel. They're members of the church, but they're giving up the truth. And he says, here's what's going to happen to you. you. You cannot spurn God. You cannot turn against God and not suffer the consequences. 
Romans 6, 23, which we quote most often, says sin deserves death. Death is not annihilation. It is not a going out of existence. It is separation from God. Physical death is when the spirit departs the body. James says, James 2. So we're created in the moral image of God. Our spirits are fathered by God, the Hebrews writer tells us, and bears the stamp of God's image on it. We've often used that in apologetics to say, why would it that a person be upset from the standpoint of six million Jews being killed or one person being murdered? Why is that bad? How, why do you feel uh, terrible about a little child being raped and abused? Because there's that part of you that is in the image of God and there's a sense of oughtness that something ought to be done a certain way. And when it's violated, we're upset about it. I'd hate to know I couldn't be upset because a child of mine did wrong. I'd hate to know <laughs> that I couldn't be upset at myself when I know I've transgressed God's law. How would you ever repent? Why would we ever want to offer an invitation? Why would there be a song that plays upon our mind and causes us to reflect on our own lives in the light of truth to motivate us, to get us to act. It's because we do have that sense of oughtness. And there's a sense of shame when we know we've done or left undone what we ought to have done. I'd hate to know we were in a world that had none of that. And I'm sure Felix found out that he had a conscience when he trembled. There he was, an old pagan as he was, a climber of uh, offices in the Roman Empire, doing as they did. And yet when he heard a judgment to come, he trembled after having heard of the righteousness of God. That standard of conduct. And you're going to give an account to God someday for the way you think, what you say, what you do, and what you leave unthought, unsaid, and undone. Sins of omission. Sin deserves punishment. As I said this morning, so many of us, just the average person, even in the church, we ought to cultivate more of a study of it to understand from God's viewpoint how bad sin is. And I've said many times, there are two ways I can begin to understand it. What it cost heaven to save us from it. And the place provided for those who spurn the love of God and the gospel to save us from it. That's how God views sin. And we need to train our minds as members of His Son's church to think of sin in that way and understand how we commit sin and not want to do it. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Well, what am I going to do about that, Isaiah? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. I've got to learn to receive with meekness the engrafted word. It's able to save my soul. There's not a thing in the world else that can. It's the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. It's the sword of the Spirit. It alone can pierce into the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4, 12. Thus Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. Preach the whole counsel of God. Well, it's held in contrary to God's love. It certainly seems to me to be a reasonable thing when you know the justice of God and how heinous sin is and what life in the flesh on earth is all about. We brought this out, I can't remember if it was last week or the week before, how that man too many times, even some members of the church, try to make God over in his own image. We referred to Psalm 50 and verse 21, These things hast thou done. And I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thy eyes. I may have a view of what's orderly and be completely contrary to God. I've got to know how God wants it ordered. 
as David said, when they transgressed the way of the law of Moses, said the Ark of the Covenant was to be transported, caused the death of Uzzah, but when he got back to studying the law, he found out how it was supposed to be, and he said what we did and the way we tried to transport it was contrary to the law, and we did not seek him after the due order. Well, he couldn't know how God wanted it done unless he read how it was done. And we can't know today what God's will unless we study it. I hear so many people all the time think, I think this or I believe that. I hear more say I believe that and what they really mean, I think that. Biblical faith comes from the Word of God. If you cannot give book, chapter, and verse, as it were, for what you believe and what you practice, then it's not by faith. And we're to walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5.10. But most of the time people say today, well, I, I believe this, or I believe God will do this. And they're saying basically, I think this, because they don't know the Bible well enough to know what he wrote about the matter. God is love, and I'm glad to say that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have the wonderful story of love tell it to me again. It wouldn't be a beautiful story. And all these songs we sing about it couldn't come except that God loves us. And though we got ourselves an awfulest fix when we sinned and all have sinned, Romans 3.23, but God in spite of that saved us. Do you ever remember as a child getting yourself into something when you've been told, stay out of it. Get away from it. Don't go over there. But we did anyway. And then mother or daddy had to drag us out. And in those days, that meant you got us banking. I wonder what would happen if somebody really today were to give their child on their naked little legs a good switching like kids got when I was little. I think probably they'd put them in the in the jailhouse, if not under it. I remember one day when our playmate, she was a year or two older than me, came over to the house. She was still crying. She had had on shorts, and her mama had literally tore her up with a switch, and she had streaks all over her legs. Well, I think of what would happen nowadays. Some do-gooder would call up the health bunch, and here they'd come, and they'd do an investigation. How sad. But well, that's where we are. We've got to face reality. But that just change God's will on the matter. And when he comes to disciplining his people, and when it comes to exercising his justice, then he's going to do it. And man can't stand in between him and that. The need for punishment does not show a lack of love on God's part. But a lack of love on the wicked's part. Listen to John 14. Verses 23 and 24. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my saying. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Man stands condemned. Jesus didn't come into the world and then condemn everybody. They were already condemned and he came into the world to save them. He's the great physician. It's clear from 2 Peter 3, 9, God doesn't want anybody to perish. But man, being a free moral agent, must repent or perish, Luke 13, 3. There's no reason from God's view for one to remain in sin. We have the power not to. We have the power to take hold of God's saving hand, if you please, in the gospel. Listen to the prophet Ezekiel 18, verses 21 through 23. Notice the reflection of repentance, the resolve to break down our old stubborn will and turn away from evil and start doing good as the Bible defines it. 
He says, cast away from you all your transgressions. Well, if we can't do it, how can he tell us to do it? We can cast them away. Whereby ye have transgressed. Now notice. And make you a new heart and a new spirit. Now who's supposed to do that? I am. All men are. It's not something God does against your will. Now listen. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. That just simply teaches God has a responsible position in our salvation. Guess who makes the difference? We do. Will we believe Him with such a belief that we will take hold of His will and set ours aside and turn from those things contrary to Him and embrace the truth no matter the sacrifices? Rather than eternal torment, what is argued is that God must mean permanent destruction because I have a false view, number one, of death and a false view of destruction. Notice what they say. Watch Star Society, Let God Be True, page 97. Since God destroys soul and body in Gehenna, this is conclusive proof that Gehenna, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, is a picture or a symbol of complete annihilation and not of eternal torment. Well, the verse they're referring to is Matthew 10, verse 28. Where our Lord said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. They have a certain definition they give to kill and destroy. The word in the original language, the one that is used in the Greek, is apolumi. And it means destruction or ruin. Another favored verse that they use and misuse and twist is 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 9, where the scripture reads, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Now the Greek word there is olethros, and it means prolonged destruction or ruin. Now, it takes some reasoning, but the Bible's a reasonable book, and God made us be able to reason. And we had the plea of the prophet throughout the whole Bible saying, Come, let us reason together. And Paul reasoned of righteousness, judgment, come, and of course, self control. Apollea, used in conjunction with Apoli, Apolami, and Lilithrus has the double idea. In other words, you put them together. You don't just look at one and say the other one doesn't exist. Therefore, it doesn't influence my, influence my understanding of this thing. No, I have to take all of God said. And you know, if we all spoke and wrote Greek and understood it as well as Paul, we would still have to take all of what God said on the matter before we draw our conclusions. I was reading on, I'm on one of these lists that discusses Greek on Facebook. And I haven't found it all that really helpful but somebody was discussing something I don't know what it was sometime back so I just thought I'd see what kind of response I'd get I said do you know when everybody understood wrote and spoke Greek that's when all the false doctrines still took over things so just because you know Greek as well as Paul doesn't guarantee you're going to be right and most of the people on that list are all denominationists so what does that tell you you still got to rightly divide the word of truth, whether you're speaking Greek or whether you're speaking a translation in English. Still involves how to ascertain Bible authority. So you take uh, Apollia, and you take Apollonai, Apollo, uh, Apollumi, and Olethrus, and you get a double idea. And it comes down to this loss, to be lost, to disappear, destruction, and corruption, destruction, death, ruin. And some of the commentators are Greek lexicographers, actually, talk about apoleia is so rich in meaning that it would be impossible to convey its definition in a single English word or expression. 
But the fact that perdition can be understood as destruction and ruin, now watch, does not imply that it involves the annihilation or destruction of the personality. That's where they make their mistake, is that they think ruin automatically means you're out of it. You don't exist anymore. There's nothing the Bible teaches that, and the Greek words don't. When Jesus said that no one fills old wineskins with new wine because it will cause the skins to burst, apolia, the idea is that they would break and be ripped. In a similar way, men can also be destroyed and corrupted without being totally obliterated. That which is esteemed worthy, beautiful, and mighty is lost. And that's what's lost in hell by everybody that goes there. What remains is corrupt, reduced to a pitiful character to the original, and it falls short of that which it, was destined, which it was destined to become. That's what happens to the loss in a devil's hell. God never intended that people go there. But being a free moral agent, He gave man the choice. You can choose. And sadly, most people choose the wrong way. So how is this used in regard, regarding the word hell? Matthew 25, 46, everlasting punishment. Romans 2, 8 through 9, tribulation and anguish. Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, torment without rest. That's the destruction. That which does not exist cannot be tormented, punished, or have anguish. By the very fact that they're tormented, if you please. The rich man said, I'm tormented in this flame. That's his punishment. It's not just a persecution. It's not anything like that. He is getting that which he deserved by disobedient life. That which does not exist, then you can't torment it. You know, sometimes things get silly. Imagine trying to torment a tree limb are trying to torment something without feeling, without personality, without anything like that. Justice is the idea of a fair and impartial reward or punishment as the person deserves. Now, when the Watchtower Society says hell is unjust, they are saying eternal punishment is wrong exactly what they're saying because a thing that is just is right that's the idea of, of justice it's right but they're saying that it's really wrong because it's contradictory or inconsistent to the quality of being righteous or impartial well that's an indictment of God they don't even realize how blasphemous that is to say that God doesn't know what he's doing that really he's a demon of some sort. Consider with me what we have back over in Ezekiel. Chapter 18. And we'll begin at about verse 25 and read for a ways. Just think about this. As the prophet was speaking out there in Jerusalem as they're being condemned and uh, he wasn't in Jerusalem. He had already gone along with the captivity over in one of the earlier captivities into Babylon. Jeremiah's back there in Jerusalem. And all this punishment's coming down upon them because of their long-term transgressions. And they wouldn't repent. Prophet after prophet was sent to them. They wouldn't repent. Now Ezekiel's over here dealing with a bunch of people who have already been sent to Babylon, but they've got the idea we won't be here long. We'll be able to go back. So he's over there saying, oh, yes, you will. You might as well plant your vineyards and build your houses. You're going to be here. You're going to suffer this punishment because you wouldn't listen to God and you wouldn't obey the law of Moses. Year in and year out, you wouldn't do it. So keep that in mind as you hear the prophet speak. Yet ye say, Ezekiel says, the way of the Lord is not equal. What did the Jehovah's Witnesses just say? They just declared the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now. O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? What he's saying is, I'm God. You're not. Surely just a casual looking around will tell you that. 
when a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and dieth in them for his iniquity that he hath done shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, The way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel. In other words, I'll mete out sentence upon you. Every one according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you, as we read a while ago, a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. You know what he's saying? I don't want this to happen to you, but you've chosen to violate my will, and I am a just God, and therefore you must be sentenced according to the law. There's no capriciousness here. There's no one well, you offended me today. I don't like the way you curled your hair. I don't like the way you sounded your voice. None of that. And in this, brethren, is the foundation of all the legitimate laws of God in this world. The whole jurisprudence system is based upon the idea that here is a body of law to which all men are amenable. Our constitution is based upon this. Every other constitution, if it's what it ought to be, is based upon the idea that there is a codified law that men must abide by. And you may be crying up a storm because you violated it, but you must suffer the consequences. And now God says, but I'm a merciful God. I'm a God full of favor, and I offer you a way out. Since you're a free moral agent, you must take hold of it, which means you must do the turning. And you must turn to me and my law, confessing your sins and adhering to the truth. And every place you find that in the whole Bible, God is saying, I'll forgive you. I'll take you back. I'll carry you to heaven if you will but do that. Now what does that say then about hell? It's a prepared place for prepared people, just like heaven's a prepared place for prepared people. The people that go to hell have chosen to reject everything about God as far as honoring Him as God. And the only way I know I can bring glory to God and honor Him correctly is to obey His will. I'm not bringing glory to God because I think it's nice and I want to bring glory to God and I just do it and I can't find anything in the New Testament that authorizes me to conduct myself that way. No, His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are than our thoughts. And without the revelation of God's Word, we would know those high ways and high thoughts. So receive with meekness, here it is again, the engrafted word, the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. I have the power to do that and escape the eternal punishment that abides or that awaits those who abide in sin now. If you need to obey the gospel or if you need to confess sins as a child of God, then we invite you to obey the truth while we stand and sing.